One of the most important steps for burgeoning film buffs is coming to silent cinema, but this can be a daunting task. See, silent films are a lot like hard liquor. The first time you try it, it's probably not going to go down easy. You might like it, but it's going to take some effort to finish, and it's probably going to be a little rough. The reason being, if this is your first time, you just don't have the palate for it. You may have seen a few art house films or black and white movies, just like you may have had some beers or coolers before, but the basic storytelling grammar of silent movies is so different that you can't digest them in the same way. But if you hang in there, and you keep sampling films which challenge your palate, you might just develop a taste for it. You'll start to indulge effortlessly. You'll be able to articulate what works, and you'll start to get a sense of what flavors you like. That's all well and good anyway, but where does one actually start? The world of silent cinema can be vast and overwhelming after all. How should you actually start watching silent movies? Well, I decided to throw together this little guide to help any newcomers by both organizing what sort of films you should start with and how you should approach them. 1. Start with the comedies. Specifically, these guys. Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, and Harold Lloyd. Silent films can be heavy, so starting with the comedies can do a lot to lighten things up, and these three are famously credited as the great comedians of the silent era. They say comedy is the quickest genre to age poorly, but that isn't really true of the physical comedy these three mastered. Gags from these films tend to be built around action and reaction. These films are full of scenes where a character with a clear goal is placed in a situation which will challenge what he wants. Sometimes this is a really big and important goal, and sometimes it's more mundane, but the core is our clown working towards something they want. The humor comes from the cause and effect sequence, which emerges from pursuing a relatively simple goal and the massive amounts of ingenuity required to actually achieve it. And this simplicity is a big part of why the comedies from these guys still play so well. It's very easy to identify and relate to the scenario at hand, which makes the zany escalation of problems and solutions so fun to watch. Physical comedy also overcomes a lot of the more archaic techniques that run through silent cinema. Elements like the lack of cutting or the broad pantomime that makes these movies feel old just feels a lot more natural here. Most gags play better in long takes and lose their sense of spontaneity with too much cutting, while the over-the-top gestures of silent film acting play really well in the heightened physical situations our trio of clowns find themselves in. So the things that make so many other silent films seem like these bizarre documents from the before time are precisely what makes the silent comedies so damn good. Another thing you won't see a lot of is title cards. I mean, you'll get a few to contextualize the story, but these films are so defined by action that there isn't really a need for a plethora of titles. These three filmmakers are not only masters of their craft, but their work is still really accessible to a modern audience. The sentimental streak that runs through so much of Chaplin's work makes for some very clear and powerful emotions that largely overcome their age. You can critique something like City Lights for being a little too saccharine, but it's hard not to feel some joy as Chaplin excitedly rushes to buy flowers just so he can talk to his crush again. Meanwhile, Keaton and Lloyd were such daredevils that their movies thrive as pseudo-action films where our heroes flirt with danger, made all the more impactful given both guys do their own stunts. So if you're the kind of person who likes watching Jackie Chan swing from the side of a bus, you'll probably enjoy watching Keaton cling to a moving train. If you like watching Tom Cruise scale the Burj Khalifa, you'll probably enjoy Lloyd scaling a clock tower. And that's the other reason you should start with the comedies. They were made to entertain. That's not to say they aren't also great works of art. Ones which make salient critiques of, say, capitalism, or masculinity, or war. But they're also pieces of escapism, which aim to be the best pieces of comedy possible. If you're looking to actually enjoy silent movies, this is Exhibit A. Two, start with shorts. If you're accustomed to the pacing of modern Hollywood, silent movies are probably going to feel slow to you. Because of this, it's probably not a good idea to start by throwing down with all four and a half hours of Mabuse the Gambler. Instead, stick to shorter runtimes. All of the silent features from Chaplin, Keaton, and Lloyd are well under two hours. Keaton's Sherlock Jr., which is a complete masterpiece of silent comedy and special effects, is only 45 minutes. And of course, you don't have to limit yourself to features. Shorts, which can range from being under a minute to more than half an hour, were prominent forces of the silent film industry. Before they started making features, our trio of clowns perfected their craft in a series of inventive shorts, which see some of their most ambitious and creative gags. These shorts might in fact be the best way to introduce yourself to the great silent comedians, as the format distills their work to its purest essence. 
Most comic shorts tend to be built around one clearly defined scenario, and squeezing as much physical comedy from that scenario that's humanly possible. If you want to step away from comedy, you still have a lot of options. Maybe you want to see what the big deal is with that D.W. Griffith fella, but the notion of watching a three-hour hate crime isn't especially enticing. Well, a lot of Griffith's shorts, especially The Musketeers of Pig Alley and A Corner in Wheat, are arguably even more innovative while also being much more compact in their runtimes. Griffith's short films also tend to be a lot less problematic than the likes of The Birth of a Nation. Well, for the most part anyway. If you're interested in seeing more movies directed by women, Silent Shorts have got you covered. Early filmmaking pioneers, like Alice Guy Blush and Lois Weber, made some of the boldest cinematic innovations in their early shorts, which have been conveniently collected, along with a lot of other films, in Kino's amazing First Women Filmmakers Blu-ray set. And you can also find a lot of these films organized on Netflix. Some of these early works from the likes of Weber or Griffith will likely feel older than the comedies which came in the 20s, but the tighter runtimes make it easier to engage with these cinematic innovations in more bite-sized chunks. Maybe you're thinking, though, that you just want to see some weird and memorable visuals. If so, check out Chien de Lou, a short masterpiece of surrealism with imagery that still resonates. And maybe you're thinking, fuck all this important history, I just want to see cute cat videos. Well, don't worry. Silent Shorts have you covered. 3. Stay off your phone. So this is maybe an obvious piece of advice that goes for all cinema going, but I think it's especially prescient when we're talking about silent movies. The temptation to grab one's phone when watching a movie at home is high, and I don't say that with judgement, as I feel the same thing, but it's important to resist the urge during silent films. For one, you're not going to understand what's going on. Most of the time we can get away with being on our phone during modern movies, especially if they're in the language we speak, since we can passively absorb the dialogue and generally follow what's going on. But for obvious reasons, you can't really do that with silent film. Everything is relayed visually. Sure, the music used can help guide the tone, but that's more rooted in emotions than actual information. So if you're staring at your phone half the time, you'll probably be pretty confused. More importantly, not only will you not understand, but you also won't enjoy. The joys of silent movies come entirely from skillful visual storytelling, whether that's the slapstick antics of the silent clowns, the glorious world-building of German Expressionism, or the adventurous spectacle of Hollywood epics. If you spend these movies looking at your phone, you're denying yourself the very pleasures they offer. 4. Don't use crutches. Occasionally, you might come across a silent film which offers ways to make for easier viewing. The Criterion release of The Gold Rush, for example, comes with a 1942 version of the film Chaplin made that adds narration, effectively de-silencing the film and also shaving 17 minutes off the runtime. Eureka, I found it! A mountain of gold. This was actually Chaplin's preferred version of the film, but I disagree. For one, the presence of narration alters the impact of the gags. Get out. Get out! Go on! Go on! Get out! The timing is off, and the explanatory voiceover makes it feel like a children's movie. Moreover, if you're trying to get used to watching silent movies, this version won't help. Instead of learning how to read the grammar of silent filmmaking, you'll instead be relying on voiceover to carry you through silent movies. In other words, these crutches make the movies worse and hinder your ability to read them. 5. Don't cheat. This one probably seems weird, but I basically mean don't modify the film or the viewing experience to make it easier. One example of this is watching silent movies on fast forward. Now that might sound insane, but this is a thing people apparently do. So story time. A few years ago I was at this party, and I meet this guy who finds out I'm into movies, and he proceeds to tell me that he watches almost all movies on one and a half times speed so he can watch more films in half the time. And though I didn't show it, I felt a mixture of disgust, horror, and pity, the likes of which I cannot adequately describe. In any event, it might seem tempting to do this with silent films. It'll undercut the slower pacing of silent cinema, and you also won't be stepping on any dialogue. There's title cards, of course, but if you're a fast enough reader, you'll probably be able to keep up without trouble. Indeed, you could conceivably watch silent movies like this and understand them, but you also lose a lot in the process. Think about how crucial timing is to comedy, how the difference between a joke or gag that's clever and one that actually makes you laugh is often a simple matter of timing. These are the qualities you obliterate when you watch a silent film on fast forward. The timing of a gag is just as important as the gag itself. 
and there are also nuances to physical comedy that take time and attention to really appreciate. So if you alter the speed of the freshman so you can blast through Harold Lloyd's filmography more quickly, you're not going to get the jokes. And this isn't exclusive to comedy. Consider the spectacular visuals of German Expressionism. How the cityscapes of Metropolis generate the sense of reverence and awe. These overwhelming sci-fi vistas, clearly triumphs of art and technology, yet also symbols for the dehumanization of the worker in the face of industrialization. Of course, it's hard to see this when you're not actually taking the time to really absorb these visuals and consider both what they mean and how they make you feel. And in general, feelings are what's really going to get crushed by watching silent films in this haphazard way. It's hard to get swept up in the crumbling marriage and eventual romantic reconciliation in Sunrise when you approach silent movies as just a thing to consume rather than a work of art to enjoy. Don't approach movies with this kind of attitude. It's the cinematic equivalent of knowing the words without knowing the music. And speaking of music, it can also be tempting to just add your own soundtrack to silent movies. They are silent, after all. How important can the music really be? Don't do this. First off, if you're playing your favorite songs and podcasts while watching silent films, you're not watching silent films. You're listening to your favorite songs and podcasts. Moreover, while it's rare to find silent movies accompanied by the same music which played on theatrical release, distributors still do their best. The scores provided for silent movies do their best to mimic the era they come from, are sometimes inspired by notes from the filmmaker or pertain to a specific film, and usually are conceived to match the tone and emotions of what's going on on screen. Now, this doesn't always work out. The 2012 restoration of The Lodger, for example, features this puzzling musical choice. I don't know who you are But something's changed I don't know how you feel I'm feeling strange Actually, I kind of love this song, but it's still baffling that they added a very modern sounding song with English lyrics to a silent film. Also, the audience isn't sure at this point of the film if this dude is a serial killer or not, so again, weird choice. But oddities like this are the exception, not the rule. Most scores do a perfectly good job matching the tone and era, and sometimes they can really enhance the experience. Take Richard Einhorn's fantastic score for The Passion of Joan of Arc. Consider for a moment, not only how well this fits the film, but also how much it adds to the experience. Though written many decades after Carl Theodore Dreyer had died, Einhorn's music beautifully weaves with the passion of Joan of Arc, and the results are pretty stunning. So, pretty please, with sugar on top. Don't add your own fucking soundtrack. 6. Don't binge watch. Just like you shouldn't start drinking by locking yourself in a room and drowning in Jack Daniels, you shouldn't start your silent film going by burning through Charlie Chaplin's silent features in one night. Part of what you're trying to do is adjust to the cinematic language and grammar of silent movies, and that takes time. So, pace yourself. Don't binge silent movies, but sprinkle them into your regular media diet. This more measured engagement will allow you to click with silent movies more naturally. <coughs> oh, that's staying in. And once you've picked up on this taste for silent cinema, then you can go back for an all-nighter of Chaplin features, since that does sound fun now that I say it. 7. Don't limit yourself to Hollywood. As you slowly start to expand your silent film repertoire, it's important to look beyond American shores. It's not just that a lot of the best films from the silent era came from other countries, but also some of the most innovative. This is worth noting, not because of legacy or historical importance, but more simply because these films often employ techniques that will become commonplace in modern cinema. Consequently, these films are often the most exciting of the silent era. Whether it be the distorted art direction and collapsing world of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, the ghostly special effects and haunting tone of the phantom carriage, the disturbing physical manifestation of evil in Nosferatu, the blistering montage editing of Battleship Potemkin, the minimalist animation of the adventures of Prince Ahmed, the genre-defining sci-fi visuals of Metropolis, or the subtle yet devastating performance at the center of the passion of Joan of Arc, 
So much of modern filmmaking still has clear roots in the world cinema of the silent era. Now you'll probably want to get yourself ready with some lighter viewing before jumping into titles like the aforementioned, but it's worth keeping silent cinema from beyond Hollywood in mind. Because quite frankly, it was often better. 8. Have fun. I worry in putting together this little list, I've made silent films seem that much more like homework. As I sit here saying, watch this and not that, and stay off your fucking phone, and don't fast forward, what, what are you, you stupid, stupid or what? I may have inadvertently painted silent cinema as a totally joyless and purely academic exercise, and that isn't the case at all. Silent movies are wonderful. They're funny, and exciting, and joyous, and terrifying, and romantic, and badass. They offer the same range of emotional experiences that all of cinema does, and silent cinema's methods of expression are built on purely cinematic storytelling devices. To lose oneself in silent movies can be one of the best joys for any filmgoer. That's why I started this list by recommending silent comedies, since I think they're the easiest to pick up and enjoy. But maybe you disagree. Maybe you're more into German expressionism, or silent horror, or Douglas Fairbanks-style escapism, or intimate drama. Whatever the case, have fun, and watch what you like. Explore the films that interest you, and have a good time. Because while it can sometimes feel like work, there is a lot of pleasure to be found in silent movies.